my personal truth is the realization that I probably could never do any job that will require me to often have to deliver bad news. I, I don't think I'm good at it. I don't like to do it. I really don't know too many people that like to do it or enjoy it other than like some of the judges that you see on competition shows. It's like they thrive off of telling people that they're miserable or that they're terrible. But that's, that's not something that I can do. I just don't have it in me. It's not something that I look forward to doing. And like I said, I really don't do it well. So I don't want to have any kind of job where I got to regularly tell somebody like a quote for damage because I know that they're already hurt from something being broken. Now I gotta tell them that their bank is the next thing in line to be broke. That's not what I wanna do. I could never be a doctor. Some of you should be thankful for this. I don't care if I got the ability to heal people left and right, there will come some point in time where I gotta take an MRI and walk in and give bad news, and I'm not good at that, so it's probably gonna go something like, well, hey, I mean, you have all these other organs that are working fantastic. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is not something that I'm good at, and so I don't like to do it. And it's probably why God let me preach. Yeah, because preachers, pastors, get to deliver nothing but the good news. That's what I'm talking about. The word gospel actually means good news. And that's all I want to do. All I want to do is deliver good news, the great news that we are saved. Saved. Do we still say that? Is, that? is that still the term that we use to describe to somebody that we follow Jesus? Have you ever said that to somebody or asked them, are you saved? From what, the bell? Am I a document? What do you mean, am I, are you saved? What, saved for what? Saved from What? And even now, as I'm kind of spilling this out, it's like I can hear God chuckling, saying the joke's on me, because the honest truth is about the good news is that the good news is only such good news because of how bad the bad news is. There is bad news. And for real, for real, for all of us, the bad news in our life, there's really no way around it. You're going to hear me say that today often. There is no way around the bad news. That's the truth. We're finishing a series today called The Truth. Now, if you were here last week, you know that we talked about the truth about heaven, which means today is the truth about, well, hey, let's just say if you're a guest here at LifeHouse, you're here for the first time, you picked a hell of a weekend to give us a try. Today is the bad news the truth about hell. And even now, as I have to say it, I hope you can read it genuinely on my face. It is bad news. And if I'm being honest, and I will be throughout this message, I don't want to be the one that brings it. I don't know if y'all know or not, but it's still a thing that people leave churches. Uh, we don't want them to do that. No church does. We call you family. We'd love you to stay here. All we really care about is that you're in a church home somewhere, but nobody likes when you leave their church. Let's, um, you're hearing it from a pastor. It breaks our heart. Today's one of those messages that maybe you were considering giving church a chance, or maybe you've even been here for a while, and as I have to unpack this bad news, it may be one of those ones that go to the extreme that you kind of check out on us. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. There's no way around the bad news. And like I said, I'm not really good at delivering it, so I'm gonna try my best to do two things today. If you'll stay with me to the end, even if you're ready to check out right now because of what we gotta talk about, I'll try to do two things, the best that I can. I'll try to give us an accurate description of hell. And then maybe, just maybe, by the grace of God and all my humility, maybe I'll be able to help us understand why hell. Do you remember when LOL was the only tool that we had to deliver bad news and not be a bad guy? Hey, you forgot to do your job. Don't worry. I did it for you again. LOL, 
no harm, no foul, right? Do you remember that's, that's all the tool that we had to try to deliver bad news and not make the person feel like you're mad at them or you tell them something bad until we got these magical little faces called emojis. They help you deliver bad news and all you need to do is drop a smiley face or the little poop swirl guy down in there, no problem. You could tell anybody anything and as long as you put the right emoji in there, they know that I'm not, I'm not mad. I might be disappointed. I'm not a bad guy. I just, I just have to tell you something and you can't be mad at me because I smiled about it, right? That's what emojis gave us. And so what I'm gonna do to try to ease into this is let's just start it off with an emoji. Okay, I want you to take a look at the emojis that you see on your screen. Now, if you could only pick one of them, which one do you think accurately depicts hell? I'll give you a minute. And even in our campuses, if you're on, online, you can type it in there. You're at, you're at Seaburg, so you're at one of our campuses. You can, you can yell it out, right? Now, uh, my guess is that probably there may be a, a, a close runner-up with probably the little devil emoji. But most of you probably said the flame fire. Again, give me your patience, give me your grace, hunker down, and I know that if we get through this message together, you'll be glad that you at least listened to it, no matter what your stance or decision is by the time we get to it. So if you're ready to fly through this, say helicopter. Don't say that. Don't do that. The truth about all those emojis that I put in there, let's see, we had like the eyes covered and that like agony face and the flame and the devil. All of them actually are a little representation I put in there to some truth that you're gonna see as I give you some scripture about hell and its description. The first one we're gonna go in is the scripture that we've been in throughout this series. It's in Matthew chapter 25, and this is in verse 41. I'm just gonna to cut to the end of it. This is the scene at the end. I don't know if this is a newsflash to you or not, but the life that we know is not going to continue at a certain point. God has a plan for this world, all the things that are wrong with it, all the things that he wants to preserve, preserve and protect, and all the things that he wants to make new. And what you're about to see is part of the process that one day will unfold. Hell is part of the process right now until God gets to the rest of this system. Hell itself actually has a destination. And what we're about to see in this scripture is Jesus' description of it. Let's get right to the first one. And remember, I said I wanted to do two things a day, give you a description, and maybe help us understand why. And this first scripture actually has both. Look at this. Jesus describes it as a place of eternal fire. We could stop right there and just be hurt right there. He says it's a place of eternal fire. Here's the first why. This is so important a place of eternal fire that was prepared, the reason it originally exists, but that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Right now, hell is the place that from where Satan wreaks destruction on us, but it'll one day be the place that he reaps destruction on himself. These words Jesus uses are accurate. The fire is real. The eternal is real. If this is a place for Jesus' nemesis, God obviously can't be playing any games with this. Let me keep moving. In Matthew 8, verse 12, Jesus, again, he's talking about hell and he describes it as a place of outer darkness. That's why I put that... Little emoji with the hand over the eyes. Darkness. You know how much depression is associated with the lack of light? Go with me for a moment into a place where there literally is never any light at the end of the tunnel. You're talking about despair, hopelessness. He says, it's a place of outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
gnashing. Picture somebody about to get a wound treated out in the wild or something or a wound cauterized. And what do they do? They take a stick and they put it in their mouth and they say, bite. Gnashing of teeth is trying to grind through pain. Jesus is describing hell as a place of total loss, despair, agony. Internal, external punishment. And I know through all those emojis that it has gave you, you're, you're picturing some horrifying scene. It gets better. That's not even the pinnacle of the pain. In 2 Thessalonians 1.9, it says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Here it is. Away from the presence of the Lord. You ever see a fish taken out of water? I hope you didn't just watch it like that. But if you did, if you've ever seen a fish removed from water, you know that you don't have to do anything else to it for it to be in the most agonizing, horrible thing to watch a little creature go through. They're squirming. Their little gills are grasping for whatever life they can have. And all that needed to happen was for it to be removed from its life source, the most deepest, painful part about hell. Is that it is forever separation from God, our life source. <sighs> you made it through the first part. Right now is when we all can take a nice big collective, God, what the heck? What is this? Because I was here at the beginning of service and I don't remember singing any of that. We didn't sing, the punishment is yours, you're destroying everything I see. We didn't, we didn't sing that. That's not who we sang about. I thought we sang about, you love me, thanks. Welcome to your home, victory, oh man. That's who I sang about. Guys, I got, I got atheist friends, so do you. Some of them not super close, but in any of them that I've ever had a conversation with, it'll be one that I never forget. I remember too vividly sitting in some conversations and feeling helpless that I didn't even have any kind of rebuttal or anything to say against this pain that they have. I honestly have to say that I respect their stance and their faith because you have to have faith to not believe in God just as much as you do to believe in him. And this is the deal breaker. That God right there. The hellmaker God is what they have a problem with. You want me to believe that he's an all-loving, all-precious father, and yet what I see right here is some hellraiser. I respect their feelings. I empathize with them. And if I'm being honest... I struggle with wanting to agree with them. And I hope I get to keep my day job for saying that. Because I honestly don't want to believe in that God either. I said that I wanted to accomplish two things today. I told you I'm not really good at delivering bad news. The only way that I know how to do it is to be honest and transparent, probably to a fault, probably today. But I'm going to try my best to get through the second thing. I said the first thing I wanted to do was give you an accurate picture of hell, a Jesus description of hell. The second thing I wanted to do is help you maybe understand why hell. Let's pause from this for a moment because it's heavy. And why don't we just use our imagination for a moment? I think that'll be a good break from that truth. We have to come back to it. Why? Because there's no way around the bad news. But just take a time out for a moment. Let's use our imagination. I'm not a gambling man. I'm not the type of guy that can probably say, hold my beer, 
root beer and um, like say, I, watch, I bet I could do X, Y, Z. I just, I don't have that kind of confidence. I've been to casinos, y'all. I've sat in front of a slot machine because it looks like a video game that I used to play. I put money in it. I don't get it. Maybe I needed to win more than 15 cents to understand why people get addicted to this, but I, I'm not a gambling person. But I, I would bet, if this scenario ever happened, I would bet. I would bet everything I have on what I think the outcome would be, and it's this. Imagine for a moment that God, right now, in our time, summoned about a thousand people. I think we could accomplish every checkbox of age, gender, non-gender, race, everything. I think religion, belief. I think we could check off every single box of about a thousand people around the world. And imagine God summoned them. Some of them are some of our great leaders and philanthropists, people that can buy Facebook, all that kind of stuff. He, he summons them all to like this big arena. And he comes up on the Jumbotron. And surprise, it really is Morgan Freeman. We were right. And he comes up on the Jumbotron and he says to all the people here, he goes, listen, I want to give you all a little gift. And I'm going to give you 24 hours to discuss it, hold panels, do whatever you got to do. If you can come back to me in 24 hours and all of you agree unanimously on one human problem you would like me to solve, I'll do it. Gone. I would bet everything I have that if it wasn't the first, it's at least the second or third. I bet everything I have that what we would come up with, even in all walks of life, every different, the one thing we could agree on would say, God, cancer. Get rid of cancer. Because there's so many other things. We could say, end, end world hunger. Bring world peace. There's even other conditions that are terrible that we would want to see gone. But what's the most sinister thing about cancer? And before I go any further, some of you just teared up. I'm sorry. What I'm asking right now is that you acknowledge that I'm, I'm going to tread very sensitively on this. I know that some of you have lost, cried, prayed, begged God, you're even in it right now about this condition. So I'm asking for your grace and your permission to not let your pain be in vain and use this for an eternal purpose. The most sinister thing about cancer is that it's us. It's our own body working against itself. The way that cancer works is our own cells. Start, I'm not a doctor. Remember, I told you I could never be one. But from my, my, my little bit of study, the simple definition is when our own cells start to accumulate and become something so unhealthy and spread to our other organs that it destroys us. We've seen it claim so many lives. There's entire hospitals dedicated for children with it. It doesn't care who it comes for. We would say, God, get rid of this cancer that has stolen from us. And yet, we seem to have a problem with God wanting to get rid of the original cancer that stole from him. the original cancer that brought all of this is the cancer, the spiritual cancer of sin. The same way that cancer cells begin to grow and spread and become something unhealthy that originates from our own body, sin is the cancer that began to spread throughout the human free will that God gave us. That's very important to know. When we were made, God gave us the free will to choose to love and obey him because without the choice to love someone, it's just programming. And God didn't want droids or, or robots. He wanted children. And so to give us free will is something that he had to do for our love and obedience to be genuine, but somewhere in there, We chose to set ourselves up for an infection of our own design. And 
And we have a problem with God's plan to do something about it. This this snake, this villain, this devil, God makes us, and he's already ruined his chance. And so like any other jealous being, miserable being, he comes to us, mankind, with the, like the, almost like this, this sneaky predator behind an internet screen coming after your children, right? Like that's what happened. He came to us to manipulate us, to see if he can get us to turn away from God, and he was successful. And in that moment is where the first cells of the sin cancer begin to grow within the human will until it spread and metastasized and became a cancer throughout all of humanity. I'm trying to picture how God feels. I know how I feel. I'm a dad. I dare you to come from my kids. I dare you to be lurking behind some screen trying to manipulate my children into doing something. I dare you. I have no problem losing my job, freedom, life. And I'm telling you, there ain't one parent right now, there's not even a dog parent right now that's listening to me that can't relate to the pain of what Satan did and the cancer that began in us. And yet, we seem to have a problem with God the Father choosing what to do about what went wrong, even if it includes something like hell. Do you think God wanted hell? Think about it. Do you think it was ever part of his design? You go back to creation and look at all that he made, and he goes, well, let me make this terrible place. You think he didn't know that when he had to make this because of Satan and because of sin, what it was going to entail? Do, do you think that any parent right now sitting at St. Jude in tears, in prayers, wanted to put their child through the hell of not only cancer, the treatment? Or do you think it was their parental duty to make the painful, tough decision for their good? Don't you know that God knew that if hell was part of the plan to rid all of life of this sin sickness, that there was going to be a problem? Sometimes we can treat cancer, and this is the best case scenario, sometimes we can treat cancer through radiation and chemo, medicines, but there are some heartbreaking times. It's almost like... It is a win, but it's almost like a, it's almost like a catch-22. There are some heartbreaking times when the only way to deal with cancer, because it's, it's grown so deep and so attached and so metastasized in a, in, a, in a part of the body, that the only way to save the life is to remove an entire part of the body. You think that God didn't know? our condition with sin, that if he had to do something like throw it into hell, that it didn't create a problem because he wanted us but wanted to get rid of sin but were attached to it? You think he didn't know that? Let's go back to this hypothetical situation for a moment. All the people decide, that God, get rid of cancer. He goes, okay, fine. Here's what I'll need. I need one hero among you who'd be willing to take all the world's cancer. And at that amount, it will be fatal instantly. But if you do it, it'll go to that grave and never come out again. And you know what else I would bet? 
I bet that there would probably had to be a paper, rock, scissors tournament about who gets to go because I think there would be that many people that would believe that saving humanity from cancer would be, a, it's Memorial Day weekend, y'all. At least in America, we believe, right, that we honor those who say, I'll go, and I'll go the furthest distance, and today we thank you. Past, present, future, thank you, military. Thank you for those who gave and sacrificed. That's why I know that if this scenario was real, some, we would have to say, no, we got to pick. More than one person would say, I'll do it. For the sake of my children and their grandchildren, the generations to come, you get rid of cancer, I'll take it. And also the reason why I know that what happened is because I know I'm being hypothetical, but this is based on a true story. God knew this about hell. God knew in this system of having to destroy sin and the devil and all of his works that go along with it, he knew that to do that, he could still keep us if there was one person who would be willing to take all of the sin cancer and sin punishment on themselves. That's it. That's the plan. And here's the problem. No one could do it. Not Abraham, Moses, David, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, Buddha, Dr. King, Gandhi, nobody fit the bill. Because the person in a hypothetical situation had to be cancer free. In this real situation, you have to be sin cancer free. And there was no one found in all of humanity with that description. It's like we just keep circling around. I told you there's no way around it. It's like we just keep circling back around to the bad news. Okay, I've done all I can do. I'm bad newsed out. If all you have in your mind right now is those little four emojis that are the agony and the pain and the suffering of hell, let me right now give you some new ones. God loved this world. So, so very much. He loved the worst of people and the best of people so very much that he was able to finally find the one who was sin cancer free and worthy and it was his own liking. It was his own son. It was God in human flesh, Jesus. Loved us so much that he allowed all the sin cancer of the world to be thrown onto him, pushed him onto that cross emoji, threw him into the grave, forced him into the pain, the punishment, and the suffering of hell until God brings him out, out of the grave with the keys of hell, still hot in his hands, no doubt, so that anyone who believes Believes me today, believes the truth I'm telling you right now, would never, never perish, never have to go anywhere, anything that looks even relatively close to hell. Not today, Satan, not today, but have life now and forever, 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 ever, forever, forever, ever, amen. There is no way around the bad news, and it don't matter, because Jesus is the way out of it. Way out of it. Into eternity out of it. I get it. I, I, I was tra I'm telling you, I'm being honest. I, I can even, I understand why someone would not want to believe in the God who judges us with a gavel, takes one look at our wrongs, and flicks us into the bonfire. I don't want to believe in him either. I don't believe in the God who throws in people to hell. I believe in the one who dove head first into it to pull us out. That's who I believe in. The good news is only good news because of how bad the bad news is. And when you get the contrast of those two little emojis, the ugliness of hell, but the gloriousness of what God did for you, of what Jesus did for you, you're different. You worship different. You live different. You obey different. You want to give different. As a matter of fact, you want to live like you were worth dying for. Because you were. And you know what it means to live like you're worth dying for? Some of you will get to experience, whether it's niece or nephew or children, given a gift that they've always wanted. Give them the gift, they open it up. Oh, it's amazing. 
You, go, you turn around the back of the box, you take off all those, you talk about hell, you take off all those twisty things and finally get it out. The kid's playing with it, you walk out to the kitchen to put eggnog creamer into your coffee and you come back, the toy's laying right there standing at the carpet and your kid is playing with the box. Here's your gift. I paid for this. What are you doing playing with the trash? Gehenna is one of the names that Jesus uses to describe hell. And it was an actual place out on the outskirts of Jerusalem where people would take and burn their trash. And Jesus uses that as an example to describe hell because that's hell's purpose, to rid the world of its trash. And so if Jesus gave us a gift with his life, what are you still doing playing in that trash? Sin is nothing to play with. You have been freed from it, healed from it, removed from it now and for eternity. And even though it still runs rampant until God rids us of all of it, it still has this way of trying to pull you back and play with it. And you need to live like Jesus died to forgive you of that. Because when you live like you're worth dying for, you share like Jesus is worth living for. Jesus' final words before he went back to heaven as we await his second return. That's part of the truth. That's one of the best parts about the truth is that he's on his way back. Before he parts, he gives us our instructions. You've heard this before. You know this is called our, our commission. It's our great commission. It's in Matthew 28. It's verses 19 and 20. He says, listen, if, you, if you're going to share like Jesus is worth living for, I need you to go and make disciples. I need you to go and tell people about this good news. All the nations, starting in your own backyard, starting on your socials. Maybe you're called to go around the world, but I want you to tell all the nations, baptize them. Let them know God and find family. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey. Let them help make a difference about this good news. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. If what I said today about hell scares you, I want you to know Stephen King, don't get none of the credit for this. Don't you dare give him credit for it. I put too many tears and prayers into getting this ready. What I'm trying to say is that hell is not a horror story. It's a hero story. It's Jesus' hero story. It's your hero story through and on behalf of Jesus to those that you care about hearing this. This is my day job, y'all, and I love it. I love that I get to share the good news of Jesus with the people that you care about. We care about them. We do. We honestly care about the people that you want to invite and come and hear the good news. But it is not my job or Patrick's or Jay's or Michelle's or Shereya's or Margaret's or Nelson's or anyone's job to care more about the people you care about hearing the good news of Jesus than it is yours. You got to care like hell. Don't let the flames of hell cause fear. Let them fuel your faith into action. You have a gift of life now and forever in Jesus. And you're supposed to be the first person to share with the people that you love and care about hearing this. And sure, it doesn't always work out. We tell you guys, invite people to church, invite people. Well, you know what we're really hoping? Sure, we want them here, but we hope that they actually arrive here already knowing God because you talk to them about it. And sure, it doesn't always work out that way. We got your back. We're going to say it every weekend, the good news. It don't matter what we talk about. We're going to end on one thing. Hell is the destination for sin and all evil that Satan has caused. But Jesus is the way out of it. Is that your decision today? Now's the moment to believe in what we've talked about today, to believe that hell is real and it was never meant for you or anybody you love. Jesus was willing to take the sin cancer onto himself 
to free us from that. Heaven is our destination. Do you believe it? That's, do you believe it? And if you do, yes, Jesus. Say that right now. Yes, Jesus. And if you say it, please let us know, okay? You're going to see in the comments a link. If you're watching online, click on that and tell us. At your campus, we have a prayer team. You should probably go and pray with someone and thank Jesus for this new life that you have. That's what they're there for. And at Seaburg, you guys are in the back of the room. Here's the other thing as we close. We're going to sing a song called The Truth. And as we sing this song, for some of you, you have people on your heart that you know need this truth. I want to ask you, are you praying for them? Are you praying for them? Are you praying for the opportunity to have the conversation? Are you praying for the opportunity to have the right words? Are you praying for the courage of God to do it? And are you praying for them every day until this happens? I want to invite you specifically to come be with our prayer team. As we close, pray with them. Pray with them for the people that need the truth. There's no way around the bad news, but there is a way out. And you need to pray that over them. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we do not have to fear hell. We thank you that heaven is what you've always intended for us and that Jesus was willing to give it to us. God, I pray for the courage, for the movement of the spirit in all of us to be gospel livers and gospel speakers to anyone that you would bring us in contact with. This is the urgency of the good news, and it's all that matters. We collectively today say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.